Looks like I see a lot of night photographers here. Yeah, right on. <laughs> I like this, I like this. Welcome, welcome. Um, we are part of National Parks at Night. My name is Gabriel. We've got Matt Hill up here and Chris Nicholson. We are three-fifths of, uh, of, of National Parks at Night. We started in 2015 and uh, we offer night photography education, adventures all over the, uh, the world, as well as conferences, both virtual and online. So if you want to learn night photography, come hang about with us under the stars. Who here has, uh, do we have any NPAN alumni here? Yeah, woo, woo, nice, 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 nice. All right, so we've got a lot of information for We've got a lot of information for you, and uh, we want to get through it. So I'm going to kick things off, and I'll see you guys in a few. So tonight, today's, tonight's, I do like that we're starting at 4 o'clock. By the way, I hate when night photographers get asked to do presentations at 9, 10, and even 11 in the morning. This is much more realistic. All right, so our presentation here is called Seize the Night, Unleashing the Power of Photography After Dark. Huge thanks, uh, uh, shout out, and congratulations to uh, b &H celebrating their 50th. Um, some of you might know, exactly, let's give it a little. <laughs> b &H has been an incredible partner of ours um, when we told them what we were doing. b &H supports education, and they supported us. They helped get the word out. They've helped support us when we wanted to borrow gear or, or just help us in many, many different ways and always have given us a platform to spread our Night visions. So really, really thankful to BNH. So again, happy birthday, BNH. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! Again, this is the rest of the team at National Parks of, uh, at Night, missing our Lance and Tim. Um, but we, again, lead night photography, we lead over 20 night photography workshops, hands on workshops to instructors at national parks as well as all over the world. You can find us there. We also put on, every, at, the, at the first weekend in, uh, every, in February, we put on a virtual summit, night photo summit. Um, come check that out. We, that's a great way for us to gather global inspirations um, who are working in different fields of night photography. You know, we're talking more educators, astronomers, um, rangers, et cetera, are coming and talking about night photography there. It's a great, great coming together and, you know, easy to get to because it's online. Uh, but if you want that in-person experience, we actually just celebrated our first in-person um, night photography conference called Nightscaper, and it was in Kanab, Utah. Amazing, we're gonna have it again in Kanab, Utah next year, um, sometime in September. Um, and uh, the, uh, that's a great place. We got over 300 people there that it's all about bringing this community even closer together. So if you're really passionate about it, Again, we assemble about 15 to 20 instructors, all of different you know, themes, and, and we try to offer the full platform for you to take in. But also in Kanab, Utah, you are steps away from dark skies. So you're out, you're inside, and then you're stepping outside and putting those inspirations, those tidbits that you're learning out into practice. So come follow us there. I am gonna talk about my favorite subject, something that I have been exploring since I started photography, the first camera I bought was a pinhole camera, I'm slow to it. Um, and it's all about time, especially with, with night photography. What are we doing? You know, this is the pure essence of time. It's up to you, your choice. I know we're shooting in manual mode, but we really are always thinking, how can I bend time? How can I amplify that movement, the stars, the clouds, the moon, the water, whatever is moving? I don't have a fraction of a second to play with. I have seconds, minutes, hours. And the beauty of this is now we're creating things that our eyes can't see. Now we're truly you know, making creations. And we can understand a little bit about it, but we're actually now playing and bending time and, being, and, and tr creating some truly unique pieces. So for example, this is a fairly long exposure in uh, Capitol Reef. This is about uh, 20, 25 seconds. I jumped in the shot to give it a sense of scale. 
But then Matt and I were here photographing this and we let the cameras rip for another two and a half hours. Okay? We knew and strategically put that position so that the North Star was between the twins. And then we knew that a circumpolar star trail like this needs at least an hour to create something as powerful as this. And the circumpolar ones are, are definitely, when you think of star trails, I think people default to those type of images and they are incredibly powerful. You have to obviously point north, Polaris, find Polaris, which can be a challenge sometimes, but then you have to let it go for you know, at least over an hour. This is Dry Tortugas National Park. This is almost five hours. This is my second longest star trail I ever created. Now, for those of you who have been to Dry Tortugas, this is the only pathway around. So when I set up this shot, I knew other people were going to be walking in my shot. I knew that things would happen and that I would have to remove them. So I took, this is not one long exposure. This is a series, as I put, 191 90 second exposures. This is called stacking the star trails. Very powerful tool. And that's the way we mainly do star trails because not, it's either not dark enough or our batteries aren't you know, powerful enough to do one long exposure. There's lots of complications to it. But if we do these fractions and put them together in post, it can be easy. Here is the raw compilation of everything that happened during that four hours and 45 minutes. A lot happened. Right? There was the globes being drawn, you know, people walking safety lights, and I'm not gonna be upset, and I'm not gonna put up a stop do not enter sign in front of me, it's impossible. All these parks are ours, and again, I was, I set up on the main thoroughfare. I knew this was gonna happen. And you can remove this, it's quite easy to remove. You can do this in Photoshop, layers, and just mask them out. It didn't take me four hours to remove it, but it took me a solid hour. There was a lot going on. And again, this is your final image for it. Star trails can also be um, portrayed with video aspects too. This is 65 two minute shots that equal a two hour and 10 minute shot that I then put together in Photoshop as a time lapse. And, kinda, and this is in the Southern Hemisphere. This is, I was very fortunate to go to Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and put that together. This is a new kind of thing that I'm playing with because you know, photographers, you can't just be photographers. Right? We have to embrace video, we have to embrace audio in our storytelling. Right? So I'm, I want to show that passage of time more, and I think that now showing that video, that time lapse of the Star Trail is a really powerful way that you can play with time and show that. This is an earlier image. Uh, I used a filter. Very rarely do I use filters with long exposures, but this is sort of during twilight, and this is a 15 minute shot with a six stop filter to get me that to get me to that 15 minutes because this I could have stacked car trails but I wanted that single line and I knew this is uh, Twin Peaks in San Francisco I knew the cars came in one way and out the other way so I knew I could get I knew what I could get I researched it I'm familiar and I wanted to get everything I could capture in one single shot so using filters can be effective with, with helping us push to those longer exposures. A filter was used here. This was about a 10 or 15 stop filter to achieve a moon rise trail. Okay, so this is a 40 minute exposure, F11, at ISO 100. This is a single, sh this is a single shot. I might have used a little, some stuff might have got blown out in the lighthouse. I might have pulled a, a, a regular shot to tighten down those, those lights there. But when we start that at during twilight, the night before a full moon, we can get a, a moonrise trail with that, with the help of filters. Playing with time, lighthouses. Lighthouses are a favorite subject for night photographers. I mean, lighthouses are fun to shoot during the day, but why were lighthouses made? Lighthouses were made to be a beacon at night in stormy weather. So I love light. This is, uh, this is down in Outer Banks as a Hatteras light, and this is eight seconds, F4, 25,600. This is, I'm using a, either my black hat or a black card, and I'm basically keeping it open for eight seconds, but to create that beam effect, I'm going, I'm, I'm going back and forth, back and forth, to create that break in the beam there. 
playing with time. Sometimes we have an empty space. This, if I were to photograph this without the light painting that you see in there, it would just be a dark frame, right? This is inside of Fort Jefferson and Dry Tortugas. All of the light you see there is from the one flashlight that you see at the end of the tunnel, but I went along each row, lit it from the side, went to the next row, lit it from the side, right to the third row, lit it from the side, and then shined it, shined it back to create that little beam effect. You don't see me in this image, even though I walked through this image, because this image was for all over two minutes, and I was never in the same place for more than a second or two. Playing with time. An early playing with time. If things are moving, capture them. You know, if things are moving, if you can, get on them, ride them. Right? A people mover from Las Vegas, the now defunct uh, valleys. Uh, this was a, 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 a wonderful place for us to go and play with. And basically jumped on this. We would go back and forth, back and forth, like we were like on like some Disney ride. Right? And, and the exposures were fairly short because it's very bright. This is a two and a half second exposure. And we would just ride it experimenting. One second, two seconds, two and a half seconds, three seconds. You know, the ride took whatever, a minute. But we were we we must uh, you know we experimented, played with time, different different ways, and uh, got all these different things. So next time you're on a people mover, bring a tripod. Our New York City, using a tripod, but playing with time now. Now that I have this is four seconds and purposeful, uh, or was it intentional camera movement? ICM, intentional camera movement. We can do that with or without a tripod. I like using it with a tripod, so I just have it set up, got that skyline shot, and then just during the exposure, slowly bend it down. <laughs> slowly bend it down for that. Who saw the Tribute of Lights last night? Or there, we have a friend that's practicing, so you see the Tribute of Lights on for the next couple nights. It, was a, it made my heart jump a bit, I, I, very close to me. I've been, able, I've been fortunate enough to shoot under them. This is actually inside the Tribute of Lights. This is my, me with a fisheye lens pointing directly up, four seconds rotating the camera all the way around. How can we push the limits? Playing with time. It's a never ending rabbit hole. I've been playing with time for over 25 years and it still excites me. It's one of my favorite night portraits I've taken. Used a flash, popped a flash on, our, on a wonderful model there and then I said, walk to the camera, come closer, come closer. Okay, stop, wait in front of the camera. She held there for, this is a 20 second exposure. She probably held there for like eight seconds and then walked out. Playing with ghosts, creating ghosts, playing with time. These are, come, again, some of the things you can do. Now again, playing with time, we do have some rules that we should know about or I hate to say abide by, but we should be aware of them. Know your rules before you break them. Rules are definitely meant to be broken. Um, first one is that the longest exposure isn't always the best exposure. I know we always strive to do those epically long circumpolar star trails, but this one is 12 minutes, right? So 12 minutes, and I chose that. I didn't want, sometimes when they're so long, they get chaotic, and I didn't want the star trails taking us out of the picture. The picture is about Bannerman Island, Bannerman Castle, okay? Not about the, st not about the, the star trail should complement it. Here, it's too chaotic, right? We're underneath this arch, but we're not looking at the arch. We're always constantly being drawn to the star trails there. So sometimes too long or too many star trails can create chaos. Now again, you, that might be what you try, not saying chaos is a bad thing. Chaos in moderation. <laughs> or how it tells the story. Like this is perfect. This is uh, our partner, Tim Cooper. He did a star trail shot over a city. Yes, you can do urban star trails. And I love the chaos of the, of the airplanes here as well. It, it complements it, it's not overtaking it. So the rules for Star Point and Milky Way photography, it's a basic rule. We, you know, the things to have is a wide and fast lens and you, you're gonna use a higher ISO, so a modern camera that you're gonna be living 3200, 6400, 12800. The basic rule is 400, this is the 400 rule, it's where we all start. Divide the focal length of your camera into 400. So for instance, one of my favorite lenses, 24 millimeter, divide it into 400, you get 16.7833, round it out, 16 seconds. That is your maximum star trail 
That's your maximum sorry, shutter speed before stars start to trail in your image. There's also, once you get more advanced, and if you're printing large, we have, there's a new theorem called the NPF rule, which has a default and accurate rule that will even, this is good for, again, printing large or high megapixel cameras. And those, you can see, you're pretty much having the time. So that might seem appealing to you, but that means if you're taking away time and your aperture is already open as much as it can, that means those high SOs are gonna have to go higher and higher. So it's always a balance, a juggle at night between the ISOs, apertures, and shutter speeds. Here's one of my latest and more favorite uh, southern uh, Milky Way uh, shots here, and eight seconds. And here's all the fun stuff. If you've ne never been to the southern hemisphere, that Milky Way is we haven't seen. We don't see it up here in these latitudes. And it's gorgeous, and it's more colorful, especially if you can get into those darker skies there. But there is solutions. I said you, can, you might be forced to those higher ISOs. Well, there are solutions. There's uh, a, a that there's Adobe just has Noise AI introduced to their, uh, soft, to their Lightroom. That's been doing a very good job. But, but for a while, Starry Landscape Stacker or Sequitor for PC has done also a, a great job. You just need to collect more information. You need to take 16 pictures at least out in the field, and then you're gonna stack them in a software, and that reduces the noise significantly. So this is an image showing eight seconds with a, um, this is a wide angle lens, right? So I'm using my NPF rule, and I, my max exposure is eight seconds, but this is a 14 millimeter lens, or 20 millimeter lens. Now, telephoto, 70 millimeter lens, I'm using my 24 to 70 at the other end, now my maximum NPF rule is 2.5 seconds. So I'm having to go all the way up to 25,600. So I'm definitely taking multiple shots of that to stack and reduce that noise. I don't know any camera that's that easy um, with ISOs there. And blending time. So this is a, a composite, but it's a composite of the same. The tripod didn't move. I took a picture for the land, and I took a picture for the sky. Sometimes when there's, a new, when there's no moon out, we get no information on the landscape. And, per, and I would personally have some sort of composite, and I would want to be knowing about, I would want to know about the composite um, to help us reveal, this, to help us tell the story. I don't want just silhouettes of the foreground. So here's my first image. It's a 13 minute shot. Lens all the way open, 2.5 at ISO 1600. And then this is my, um, my star point shot. So this is 16 images stacked in Starry Landscape Stacker, 25 seconds at ISO 6400. I went up on the ISO and the shutter to get this. It's like over 10 stop difference between those two. Starry Landscape Stacker makes a mask that's easier for you to blend in now with the long exposure shot. Obviously blending takes practice, finesse to doing it. You know, there's a lot of bad blending out there, but uh, practice and uh, you just, you get better. A blue hour a blend is also an even more powerful way, though you're gonna have to have a lot more patience. Because here we are taking a picture sort of in, our in the twilight time. And then we might be waiting for the stars to come out, which could be an hour, it could be two to three hours later. This is from the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. That's a composite. Here's the twilight shot, 10 seconds, ISO 400. Okay, there's the night shot, four minutes at ISO 1600. I just embraced the clouds, they were coming. You know, I wanted something else, but the clouds came, I, and, and just, you embrace it. Here's the final blended composite of the twilight foreground for 10 seconds, and sky for foregrounds. Now, when I put these together, I also try to match their colors, right? Or, or complement their colors, so it's not like a, a distinct, you know, again, it's a blending it all the way through. This is probably my favorite blend and also the most challenging one. This is a blue hour blend plus star trails. So this is from the blue, uh, this is from uh, 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 Shenandoah National Park, just down the road. So this is the final image. This is the twilight shot at 14 millimeter. I don't care about the sky. I care about the foreground here. I wanna get information within all of, of this compass and, and this, uh, 
this, the, the, the mountains and stuff like that. So three seconds, F-16 at 400. Then I take 28 four-minute shots at my nighttime exposure, which was F-4 at 400 ISO. I, put, I collect them all, put them together in Photoshop, blend them in lighten mode. I get, my, I get this image right here, which is what I would have got, minus any of this loose light painting here or, or light viewing. But that's what I get. So there's my stack star trail that equals almost two hours. And then carefully blend them together for this composite, which again, we have our twilight foreground of three seconds and a sky for one hour and 52 minutes. So this is a few of my ways that I love playing with time. And I know it's a lot of information, but we have a ton of information on our website. Uh, I have how we got the shots, a lot of free information about that. But I'm gonna pass the mic over and we're gonna stop talking about time to a certain degree. And I'll introduce Chris Nicholson to speak about composition. All right, uh, thank you for that time, Gabe. <laughs> Matt and I were talking, we were really hoping that he was gonna say his time was up or something like that. Um, all right, composition. Um, I am not going to stand up here and talk to you about the Fibonacci ratio, or golden rule, uh, rule of thirds. I'm gonna assume that you guys know uh, the theories of composition, uh, but I want to focus on the things that night photography uh, can allow us to do with composition that is not possible in daylight. And a lot of this starts with the stars. Um, when we're out shooting in daytime, uh, and here's a photo from Cape Cod National Seashore, uh, there was a lot of elements of a decent photo here. We've got this beautiful marsh with the grasses and this water hole and there's these boathouses in the background, uh, but it's not, it's not a good photo because that sky is just completely devoid of anything interesting. But do this exact same composition at night, and now we're talking. Because we've got these beautiful stars, this, uh, it's like lace in the sky, and it creates this amazing background. So shooting the stars allows us to do things with compositions that we might not be able to get away with uh, during the daytime. Uh, it's one of the reasons I love night photography. It's one of the reasons that we always recommend going out at night with a wide angle lens that allows you to shoot these big skies filled with stars. And another thing you see when you're out there is the Milky Way. So the stars can make a great background, a nice filler for what would otherwise be dead space in a composition. But the Milky Way, now this is something we can really anchor a composition around. The Milky Way is this huge presence in the sky. It's almost three-dimensional when you see it in a really dark location. Uh, you can use this as a secondary subject or even a primary subject in a photo, like, like here. This is in Rocky Mountain National Park. And this photo is a little bit about those mountains and a little bit about the fog and the valley, but it's really about that, that Milky Way um, that if you're there in Rocky Mountain, you almost feel like you could reach up and touch it. Um, and this is the kind of composition that the Milky Way allows you to do. And the Milky Way is incredibly versatile because it doesn't look the same all the time. Early in the season, like this photo is in the spring, in the quote unquote Milky Way season, which goes from say spring to fall. You can shoot the Milky Way any time of year, but that's when it's easiest. And in the spring, it rises horizontally off the horizon, allowing you to create compositions like this go later into the evening, later into the season, and now it starts to come up more at an angle, and you can create some dynamic compositions with that. It's a whole different kind of sky you're looking at. Uh, you can even get it just going at a 45 degree angle, come later in the summer, and then as you get later in the summer, it starts to stand up. You can stick it out of a canyon or put it up to, next to something vertical, like a geyser in Yellowstone. Late in the summer, it's just sticking straight up off the horizon and you can build compositions around that again. Different compositions. And I'll give you something to think about. Now this isn't a rule, but it's a rule of thumb. It's a good rule of thumb, something to stick in your head. When that Milky Way is coming straight up perpendicular off the horizon like that, horizontal composition might not be best because it's kind of working against the subject. So I find oftentimes that vertical Milky Way looks better in a vertical composition. And the same earlier in the season when that Milky Way is rising horizontal over the landscape, 
oftentimes I'll find that the horizontal composition works better. You can use the Milky Way to fill in space. I think this photo would have been okay without the Milky Way, but it really fills in that space up in the top left corner of the, of the composition. So we've got the, the lake looks nice. This is in North Cascades National Park in uh, Washington. Uh, the lake and uh, the cliff, all these lines just pointing straight toward that mountain in the center. And the clouds, again, lines pointing toward the center. But this Milky Way creates the strongest line of all. And everything, including the Milky Way, points right to those mountains in the center, directs exactly where I want the eye to go. Now, of course, I didn't wait for those clouds to be in the perfect spot, right? I was watching the Milky Way. The Milky Way is in the right spot, and I waited for the right clouds to frame it. Took about an hour. We could also use the Milky Way to complete some kind of line of sight. So in this photo on uh, Monhegan Island in Maine, the, it's got this beautiful coastline. I'm standing up on top of the cliff and positioned it so that the Milky Way kind of repeated, kind of carried on the pattern of the coastline and creates this together, creates a nice S-curve throughout the composition. And S-curves are always strong in composition. Similar here at the Body Island Lighthouse in Cape Hatteras National Seashore. Not only does it complete the line, but in this case, it kind of mirrors the shape of that boardwalk and they create almost an arrow pointing directly at the lighthouse. So again, using the Milky Way and its unique position in the sky at that time of year to help a composition. Horizontal, vertical, diagonal, what have you, you can also make the Milky Way arch by shooting a panorama. So if you're in a scene where you've got one end of the Milky Way on this horizon and you see it stretching and the other end's on this horizon and wow, what a great subject in between, that's when it's time to break out your panorama skills. And if you want to learn how to shoot a Milky Way pano, the best guy to learn it from is sitting right over here, Matt Hill, who's just taken it to a whole new level. So far we've just talked about star points. Another strong element of composition that you can use at night is star trails. Boy, I mean, star trails could really capture your attention. Something to think about, and Gabe touched on this, is how dense do you want those star trails? How many stars do you want showing? Because they can create a completely different effect based on your choice, based on your answer to this question. And it's not a right or wrong, it's what works in each scenario. So this is a photo in Death Valley. These star trails are very apparent. They are very dominant in this composition. And most of the time, you would need a very strong foreground to balance that out. This is about as, I don't want to call it a weak foreground, but it's a subtle foreground. This is about as subtle, any subtler, and I think the sky would just be overwhelming the scene. Here, we have a lot fewer stars. Right? So this is a different effect. It's not as busy. It doesn't have that same in-your-face energy. So you might say, well, Chris, I can't control how many stars are in the sky. I go out to a dark location. There's 2,000 of them. I can't do anything about that. And that's true, but you can control how many your camera sees. If you're out under a new moon, you're going to see more stars. If you shoot with a wide aperture, you're going to, shoot more. You're going to see more stars. The camera will see more stars. If you want fewer stars, go out on a moonlit night because the moon is washing out the fainter stars. You could shoot with a smaller aperture because that smaller aperture is going to eliminate those fainter stars. So look at these two photos again. The one on the left shot at f4. The one on the right shot at f8. And you can see the difference in how many stars we see. Moreover, the one on the left was shot under a new moon and the one on the right was shot with moonlight and you can see a difference in how many stars we see. Again, not right or wrong, but visually they're two completely different effects. Back to composition 101. Two of the things that we are most attracted to that our eye goes right to in a composition are points of high contrast and lines. And star trails are both. That's why they can be so strong compositionally. This is a decent photo. I shot it in the Colorado high country. It was beautiful fall foliage with the stars overhead. But the star trails are going off the side of the screen. They're going off the side of the composition. They're not leading the eye to anything else important in the frame. This is an Acadia National Park, completely different. Here, 
I want the viewer to be looking at the shoreline, at the trees, at the rocks, at the grasses in the foreground, at the reflection, the mist on the water. And those star trails are pointing to all of that. These star trails bring the eye exactly where I want it to go. This one's a mixed bag. This is in Death Valley. The star trails on the right of the frame are coming right down into the sand dunes, into that black mountain in the background. The ones on the left, they're curving right off the screen. They're bringing the eye away from where I want it. Big Bend National Park. Here the star trails are raining right down into the canyon, exactly where I want your eye to go. The only problem here is the star trails way up in the right corner. So those are not going where I want the eye to go. So I didn't fix the vignetting. You might notice that the corners were a little darking, darker because I didn't fix the vignetting. I wanted it to be a little darker to make those star trails a little more subtle because they weren't leading the eye where I wanted. All right, so Chris, I can't control which way the stars are moving. No, you can't. But you can know where they move based on where you're looking in the sky. If you're facing north, those star trails are going to be curving around the north star. If you're facing south, they're going to be almost straight lines. Facing east and west, they're going to be coming down diagonally toward the horizon. So this is a good thing to memorize, because when you're standing out in the field and you're scouting, you can figure out, oh, the star trails are going to go this way, and that works against my composition. But if I turn here, they're going this way, and that works for my composition. So this is in Rocky Mountain National Park, and I loved the mountains, I loved the reflection, but the star trails were going off the composition. This is not the effect I wanted. It's not a bad photo, I wouldn't throw it out, but it's not as strong as it could be. So again, I can't control the star trails, but I can say, well, I can see they're going this way, I can see they're gonna go that way, and I've got a broader, pretty scene, why don't I switch to horizontal in the same exact location, and now the trails are leading the eye into the subject. So this is stuff I'd like you to think about when you're shooting star trails. A lot of people, when they're first doing star trails, don't think about this, because it's just like a new trick in the bag, and you jump in. And that's great, but try to think about where the stars are going to go, and whether that's going to work with your composition or against it. And then the granddaddy of all star trails are the star circles, right? Let's look north. How do you do this? You got to find the north star. And the trick there is to know two constellations, the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia. Um, don't be lazy and say, well, I know the Big Dipper, so that's all I need, because there's times when you can't see it. There's times when it's going to be below the horizon. But when the Big Dipper is below the horizon, Cassiopeia is always up above it. So if you know both, you can always find the North Star without any kind of visual aid. This is your visual aid. So you just follow, um, just like the diagram shows, the last two stars of the Big Dipper, or the uh, last two stars of Cassiopeia, they're going to point you right toward the North Star in the sky, rip an exposure for an hour or two or four or five, and there you go. So what do you do with this information? Now, star circles are very strong compositionally because it's like a bullseye just pulling your attention to the center. So find something interesting to put that north star over, like this shack way in the backcountry of Joshua Tree, or over a rock formation in Trona Pinnacles, behind a rock formation in Alabama Hills, or use it to fill what would otherwise be a dead space in the sky. So here it's balancing the trees that are light painted in the foreground. Without that star circle up top, this composition would be off balance. But I placed them in opposite corners to balance the composition to keep your eye going back and forth between the two. Or find something in the foreground that mirrors the shape of those star circles, like this hay bale on the Blue Ridge Parkway, or this art installation in Rhyolite Ghost Town outside of Death Valley. And when you're doing this, when you're working with star circles, Keep your eye on that bullseye. Pay attention to where it is. Because just like you wouldn't put a bright light at the edge of the frame, because it's distracting to have it there, don't put that bullseye right at the edge of the frame. Because here, that North Star was right outside the frame. And every time I look at this photo, my eye is just going for it. My brain is saying, where is that? That's a missing information here. All right? So get it well inside the frame or well outside the frame so that it's not distracting. So here, the North Star is outside the frame, but I'm not seeing circles, I'm just seeing these arcs that are radiating down into the landscape. And how do you choose between star trails and star points? Compositionally, they're very different. They have a different feeling.
This is in Kings Canyon National Park in California. I was so looking forward to shooting in this exact location. And I got there and I knew the North Star is over the mountains. I'm shooting star circles. And I set up and I enjoyed this beautiful, quiet evening, just letting the camera run for a couple of hours, shooting these, these uh, star circles a stack later. And then I got it back home and on the computer and I look at it, I said, well, it's a nice photo. I did what I wanted to do, but that's not how I felt when I was sitting there. This photo does not evoke that peaceful, quiet feeling of being at the edge of this meadow in Kings Canyon. So I went with the star points instead. It's a different feeling. Same thing with this photo in Mojave National Preserve. I scouted this in daylight. I intended to do the star trails, but I got home and I said, this photo is not a quiet desert night. But the stars make it so. So think about that, the effect of star trails versus star points. And then finally, we're talking about stars, but don't forget about the clouds. A lot of people say, oh, it's cloudy. I'm not going to go out shooting tonight. Please shoot the clouds. I love juxtaposing clouds with starlight. I love that dynamic. It's even better if the clouds are blowing fast enough for me to get cloud streaks in the relatively short exposure of 20 seconds. If I'm in this situation, if I'm out shooting at night and there's clouds and they're moving fast enough for me to blur them, I go and I find a spot where I can build a composition where the clouds are either coming right at me or going directly away from me because then I get these great streaks that just streak in right toward the center. And you can build some very, truly amazing compositions with that. So there you go, some things to think about with composition at night, uh, everywhere from stars to star trails to clouds. Okay, and uh, here's uh, my buddy and partner, Matt Hill, talking about perspective. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, hard acts to follow. I'm doing my best. I've been focusing a lot uh, lately on perspective and a field of view. And to me, it means choosing your position or your field of view or projection, you know, and it's very powerful. Sometimes the first thing I look at to help people understand a perspective is putting things together, things that you might not know the scale of with the things that you do know the scale of. For instance, people. In this case, as astro landscape photographers, we often strive to not include humans in our images because it's about you know the cosmos and the landscape together. And we kind of want to remove our persons from that because we want to develop a relationship with something more infinite, right? And we are definitely finite, right? But when I do include people, it's always for the express purpose of showing scale. And in this case, it was easy to show the Grand Wash in Capitol Reef and just how deep and narrow that canyon is. In fact, this was early on when Gabe and Chris and I were uh, out scouting for the first time and uh, we were walking back through and I saw, I was leading and I turned around just to see where everybody was and I asked them to stop and set it up again when I set up my camera so I could make this picture because the scale was everything. And I said, I, will, I really like that and I wanna celebrate that. This composition of the arch uh, in Joshua Tree, I love it. It's balanced and it's full of interesting shapes but it took on more meaning to me when you can see just how big the arch is. And you, do, you get that when you find the human in the frame. When you see that small photographer down in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see just how big this arch is. Suddenly it takes on a different meaning than this. They're both wonderful in their own right, but this one to me is the winner in those two compositions, because the human helps tell the story. Somebody who's in this frame is sitting in the front row tonight. <laughs> Hi, Klaus. It's hard to tell how big the sea stacks are in Olympic National Park. However, having some photographers in the foreground helps us understand, and also how big the Milky Way is 
So the perspective that I chose was to put on a longer lens because humans and landscapes root us upon the earth. And when you combine that with the cosmos, it creates that wonder, that feeling of awe. And to me, this tells one of my favorite stories of being an Olympic, because we all shared this together. And then this is a panorama. And again, I like to hide my humans, if you can find the human, up high on the left-hand side. They were working on their own composition, and I made this wider Milky Way composition that sort of completes an eye shape between the bow of the Milky Way and the bow of the landscape. And the scale becomes apparent when you juxtapose a human with the landscape and the cosmos. And this leads me to scale also. When we're talking about how large something is, keeping it in frame, how large you choose to put it in frame helps. This is a lesser known uh, place in Colorado. These were shot with three different focal lengths. On the left, an eight millimeter fisheye. In the middle, a 200 millimeter. And on the right, a 70 millimeter lens, horizontal as four panels of a vertorama. And each of them shot, of course, at different times of the night, but I preferred the size of this ziggurat and its relationship to the negative space around it. And I chose those focal lengths and the scale of those deliberately. And I think that choosing those things as you compose helps a lot to figure out what you want to do. You can compress things by filling your image with a longer lens. So this is 100 millimeters, and it was only three seconds long, 2.8 at 6,400. However, the core, the galactic core of the Milky Way fills the frame. And when you punch in with a longer lens, the drama of the galactic core is multiplied by many factors. And we often use as landscape, astro landscape photographers, very wide lenses because it takes in more stars. But I find that sometimes what we normally do might not be the right thing. <clears throat> so when I say I'm comfortable with this, I reach for something that makes me uncomfortable. So I'll, I'll choose a lens that doesn't work normally in my brain. Okay, what can I do to make this different? So I'll put on a longer lens or a wider lens. And in this case, the longer lens helped. In other cases, I put on a really wide lens. This is an eight millimeter lens shot at the cardinal points, you know, four different sides, one up and one down, and stitched into a spherical panorama. And I was only three feet away from the front of this train engine. But because of the projection of the panorama, I could then manipulate it so that the rails that the train runs on turned into giant circles on the side. And it's absolutely confusing when you first see it. And that's what I intended. You looked at it and you said to yourself, self, what's going on here? These are one of the things that I like to do when we're talking about perspective. And this is one of the things that's drawn me to panoramas. Because in a panorama, you can control perspective. And perhaps it harkens back to when I skipped medium format and I went from 35 millimeter to large format. Back then I learned to love controlling perspective. And I still do in digital photography. You would never know that this is a panorama, but it is. So this is a two panel panorama where the foreground was shot during blue hour. And then I tilted the camera backwards and left it open for four hours to capture the meteors. So you have the Perseids meteor shower that happened over four hours and the meteors were masked in. And then you have the sand dunes underneath that. And those two put together created a wider perspective than a single lens. But it's wider than a, neg a regular 24 millimeter, but it is a 24 millimeter, which makes the meteors larger. With a 15 or a 14 millimeter lens, the meteors would be smaller. So to me, because I've shot a bunch of meteor showers, I thought it was really important to make larger meteors. I've traditionally shot them with a 14 millimeter or a 15 millimeter. And this year's experiment was let's do it with a 24. And I think it worked out. 
field of view. When you put a single focal length on your camera, you're restricted to that field of view. And that's not a bad thing. But when you move your camera and stitch those images together, you can create an infinite field of view. This is 360 degrees wide by 180 degrees tall. So this is a complete sphere of images. This is 42 images photographed with a panoramic rig. Originally, when I shot this, I was going to make this picture. They're both the same set of images. But in the end, I realized that this image told a better story. Because I was trying to solve one thing. Behind that rock in the middle, there was a gigantic light from a construction site. And it was casting that ugly shadow that you see arcing through the bottom. I went around the other side to get that light out of my lens. But I knew that that shadow was going to create a complementary shape to the arc of the Milky Way on the other side. So I created an S-curve, or a sort of yin-yang shape, from this because I was trying to solve one problem by using a capture technique. And that's the perspective of shooting an entire sphere of images and then stitching them together with this perspective. Getting more sky or more land without making the perspective look wrong is another goal. And that's what I try to do when I approach panorama photography is try and make natural. I shot this. And then I walked forward because I had these boots that go up to my knees. And I walked forward into that freezing fjord and I made this. And I did it just because I could. I got to admit it. I love those boots. They kept my legs warm. <laughs> but this is the better picture to me. Because, and I didn't mean to do this, but there's people in it. You see the people? Now you see the scale. Right? I don't remove people specifically because I love to show the scale. Klaus also helped with this one. Fill your frame with the most interesting shapes you can. Chris talked about this, and he talked about it very well. In composition, I like to eliminate what does not serve the vision. This was carefully composed to choose a specific field of view, a single focal length, and enough room to descend into the canyon and light paint it, which I have to say, for the record, you're not allowed to do this now. They've changed the rules about light painting and natural bridges. But we did this. Two passes, it took half an hour to walk through the bottom of this canyon, waving flashlights around to light up the canyon. And during that time, we got these star trails. But we knew the top of the frame would be filled with star trails, and the bottom would be light painted. This is planning for a vertical movement of the Milky Way. I knew the Milky Way was going to end up over Half Dome here in Yosemite. But this, if you can imagine, is a panorama. In fact, it's a mosaic. That's the group of images that I shot it with. So this is three panels wide by four panels tall. And the bottom row of panels were shot static, meaning the camera wasn't moving. And then the top three rows were shot tracked with the Benro Polaris tracker. So the top has the best quality I could get for the stars, and the bottom has the best quality I could get at a lower ISO. So the sky was 30 seconds at 2.8, ISO 3200 tracked, and the foreground was 60 seconds each at f4 at ISO 3200 for a little more depth of field. This is also, like Chris was talking about, when you get that perfectly straight up and down Milky Way, a great time to compose that way. And this is a five panel tall uh, vertorama where one shot down, one forward, and then three up all stitched together to create a perspective that looks natural. And this is a forced perspective, where you take a super wide fisheye lens, and then the moon cooperates, and the clouds cooperate. And never again have I made a picture that I think that's even close to as cool as this one. This one I just got lucky, I got to say. I waited for the moon to creep around the edge of balanced rock and arches, just so I could get a little bite taken out of it but I had no idea that that moon bow was happening, but I did see the clouds uh, going around the edges of it. But this was one that I specifically saw coming, and I knew that there was that break, and I wanted the motion of the clouds to do that. Having a strong main subject helps you choose your perspective. 
this is a 26 image pano mosaic, meaning I had many rows. So the sky is 15 seconds, ISO 12800. In the foreground, I shot separately at a lower ISO. So rooting your composition with a strong main subject that's well lit is very important. But again, this is about 200 degrees from side to side because I needed to get that really tall Milky Way in there, and I did. This, I had a tripod that was a, 10 feet in the air so I could get that little bit of the lighthouse up there, and I was backed up against a fence, and also this platform is 10 feet in the air over the Hudson River. It was a really, really hard photograph to make, uh, but a single shot on an 11 millimeter lens. And this was carefully planned uh, with photo pills to make a 63 millimeter focal length, so I have the lunar eclipse passing down and mirroring the shape of the Rip Van Winkle Bridge. I knew it was gonna happen, and I knew that the eclipse was gonna happen during uh, twilight in the morning, but I let it fade into that as I shot this sequence. I could have gone wider, and I could have gotten more of the eclipse in there, but I specifically chose this focal length because I knew the most interesting parts would be here, and the moon would be larger. None of these moons were enlarged. This is the focal length that I used. Another great example I like to use is this. On the left, this is a single photo that's 37 millimeters, but it keystones, meaning the trees are tilting in, right? You see that? And to me, I don't like that. It's like, it is drawing people's attention, but maybe not in the right way. So instead, on the right, I made another vertorama, where the camera's horizontal, but I shot uh, four images at 70 millimeters instead. The first three images were during twilight, and the last image, I shot a star trail sequence, and I blended all of those together. And the trees are parallel. They don't tip in towards each other. To me, that more natural perspective makes me happier. This is an unnatural perspective, because I shot it with an 11 millimeter. So in this case, this is at least 220 degrees. And I had to light the monument in front of us by bouncing a light off the stand zone behind me. However, I absolutely loved the deep trench that was in front of me, and I wanted to capture that, so I put my tripod on the edge of the tent trench and put on my widest lens, which is an 11 millimeter, and shot this 11 panel uh, panorama, single row. And then my final example is this. This is a 15 millimeter lens in vertical orientation. It is a nine image single row pano. Uh, I lit the tree from behind, and I admit this every time I talk about the image, I got very lucky that those thistles over on the left-hand side of the image also got hit by that light. So there's a gentle balancing light on those thistles over on the other side. Uh, so perspective to me is all about taking the things that I see when I walk into a scene, and I spend a little time studying it to say what interests me, and how can I use what I have at my disposal to share this with other people? Sometimes it's a single focal length, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's a panorama. But use your heart, use your eyes, and choose what you wanna show other people, and you can put it together. Thank you everybody, we really appreciate you. We are entering our, uh, our ninth season of photo workshops and tours. Uh, if you are interested in what we do, please go to our website at nationalparksatnight.com and sign up for a mailing list because people on the mailing list get earlier notice than other people about the workshops and it's a little competitive to get in. So we hope to see you there. Thank you so much for attending. We'd like to answer two questions. So, Do we have questions? You want to repeat that one? Chris is going to answer. All right. So the question is, um, is this live? Here, you can use this one. Okay. Um, whether we ever use a, a tilt shift lens, uh, most people don't own them because they're really a uh, specialty for land, um, architectural photography. Uh, but we actually have been using them because we shoot lighthouses at night a lot. And uh, perspective distortion is a pretty serious issue when you're shooting lighthouses because um, you're kind of close and they're kind of tall. Uh, so, yes, we do use them for that a lot. 
Another question? Yes, sir. Sorry, again? The question is, how do we find the best dark sky? Well, there is, uh, there are apps, obviously, for it. Um, there is uh, the International Dark Sky Association. You know, they're, they're great, to, great to follow, but there are dark sky apps and maps out there. You know, we, we uh, are pretty fortunate that we go to our national parks, yeah. right? So uh, not all, there's definitely, you know, uh, let's, let's uh, one of our newest national parks is uh, the St. Louis Arch. <laughs> Gateway to the West, that's one. That's not a dark one, but a lot of the Utah skies are dark. That, a good good thing to think is obviously you know, uh, Big Bend. You know, and, and you look at you look at um, IDA. They actually rate the dark skies of of a lot of the national parks, and they also show you all over the world what are international dark skies. So, any others? Your closest one is the Cherry Hill State Park in Pennsylvania. It's central northern Pennsylvania. That's your closest dark sky park. So. Oh, we got over here. Okay. Question. The, the question is, when you were doing the uh, shot of the lighthouse and trying to get the various peaks, uh, of the st streaks coming off of it, mm -hmm. you mentioned your hat trick. Yes. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit, please? What's under your hat, Dave? It's all, it's all about the hat. Stetson, I recommend. No, <laughs> um, so this, the exposure was eight seconds, which took, was a full rotation or whatever my exposure needed to be for the ambient light in the sky. So then, you know, you're timing the rotation of it and you're kind of, you're, and you have to just get in, think of your arm as a pendulum. And so you're just putting, not, you know, you can use a hat, but usually a black card, you know, that you, you have put that right in front of the, of the uh, lens and, you know, well, Put it right above, so you start the exposure, and you could you count it out. You could either count it out one second and count it out, or you you, you just get in that in that motion of just going up and down, up and down, up and down. That's not the only. You can, there's other ways to do that. You can use it in a velometer, but you know there's definitely different ways. Chris and I just taught uh, a workshop, uh, Cape Cod Lighthouses workshop, and he's actually the light lighthouse expert. Uh, next book coming out all about that lighthouses. <laughs> So I don't know if you want to add to that at all, or? I think you got it. Got it? OK. All right. OK. Here you go. Thank you. Have you ever done a 360 degree pano with the Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere? Oh, you got to ride the equator, huh? I have done 360 degree panos in both hemispheres. I'm not sure I quite understand. Uh, can we get the mic back there? Oh, from the. Now I'm talking about 360 degree this way, not uh -huh. 360 degree yeah. on the horizon. Yep. Have you? So you have. So how did you put it together? There's a. There are a number of pieces of software you can use to stitch panos, um, in increasing order of success. There would be uh, Lightroom and Photoshop, and then there's uh, there's another one that. Uh, doesn't succeed as much, but if you're going straight to the top, it'd be PTGUI. Otherwise, Express is PTGUI. Uh, if you are serious about panorama photography, that is the software you will purchase and you will use. Um, it's really easy. Okay, it's it's simple to feed in images and to have it stitch it, and then if you need to man manipulate it so that everything stitches just right, it has the capability to make those adjustments whereas Lightroom and Photoshop don't have that other flexibility, such as uh, moving images around or adding control points uh, or choosing more of the projections, which is how the images are placed into a sphere. So without getting too esoteric about it, PT GUI is the software you use. And if you wanted to shoot this, you would also need a panorama rig or a gimbal to shoot uh, a complete circle up and down. Does that make sense? Time. You can, because there's different skies, the way they look, like you can't get in the Magellanic clouds in the northern hemisphere, you can only get them in the southern hemisphere. So you have to shoot panoramas of different portions of the sky. Perhaps I don't understand your question clearly then, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. We I think it is a little bit different. Okay, like, great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Thank you all so much for coming. We appreciate you. Thanks for coming.